Hello, my name is Sam Feltham and welcome to Expert Interviews on Smash the Fat Live. Uh, with me today via telephone, uh, due to a few technical hitches, is Professor Tim Noakes. How are you doing, Tim? Very, very well, thank you, Sam. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, so, um, first things first, just to give a quick introduction to all the listeners and viewers out there. Um, you are Professor of Sports Science at the University of Cape Town, um, and you've had quite a career as a um, as a scientist, professor, and doctor, um, challenging beliefs sort of not just in the nutritional field but in the exercise field as well. Um, can you just give us a quick background about about your um, about your career history? Sure, Sam. I studied medicine, and in the process, I realised that, in my view, medicine was going down the wrong route. It was more about ill health than about health. And it was also not really about sport and sports medicine. So I decided I'd rather be involved in a career in which we looked at people who are physically active, trying to be healthy, and try to promote health. And so as soon as I'd finished my medical training, I went directly into research and have been in research and teaching ever since, since 1976. And I focused on many different areas. The ones that I think most people probably are aware of is I became quite well known for studying running and I wrote a book called Law of Running. Yeah. I think the two issues that came out of my career in running was the request and how much you should be drinking during exercise. The, in the 1990s, the idea was that you must drink as much as you possibly can and that's clearly wrong. Mm -hmm. And I've promoted the idea that you should drink two-thirds. And I was the first to describe this condition of hyponatremia or water intoxication which was directly caused by this overemphasis on drinking. And the other area I'm perhaps well known for in running is the so-called central governor theory, in, in which, which predicts that the brain regulates exercise performance. So when I got interested in exercise physiology, we were told that your muscles get tired and they produce lactic acid, and that's why you can't run further or faster. And that's clearly wrong. It's what happens is the brain regulates the performance and it decides before you start how you're going to exercise and how hard you'll exercise. And so it's understanding how the brain functions will really help us understand better human performance. Wow. So that's from the running side. Mm. The, the, the other areas I've got more recently interested in, and I'm sure we can discuss it, is nutrition. Mm. And in my book, Law of Running, it promotes the idea that your runners cannot eat enough carbohydrate. The more carbohydrate, the better. Mm. And now I think the exact opposite. I think that for many of us, the excess carbohydrate is a cause of impaired performance and ill health, not improved performance. So absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's amazing how you sort of, um, you know, turned it on its head, you know, in terms of um, even in your book, uh, The Law of Running, um, obviously you talk about carbohydrate loading and things like that. And, and now it seems that you're more of, a, more of a fat loader than a carb loader. <laughs> Would that be true? <laughs> Yeah, that would definitely be true. And uh, again, I, I, you know, I don't want to put everyone off cover loading. I think no. there probably are one or two people who can benefit from it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a few more. But I think that what happened with me was I've got a family history of diabetes, and I didn't read the signs that I was becoming diabetic, and I, I missed the signs completely. Mm. And even though about, or even though I'm fully trained as a medical doctor, I wasn't really warned that you can run as much as you like and you can be as fit as you like and you can be relatively lean. But if you're taking a high carbohydrate load and you've got bad genes, the possibility is that you're going to develop diabetes and that was my outcome in the end. And when, when I realized that's what had happened and I realized that my books were promoting carbohydrate overconsumption for people like me who maybe have got a history of diabetes in the family, Maybe they're what I call carbohydrate intolerant. In other words, they don't metabolize carbohydrates particularly well. To continue to tell those people that they must eat lots of carbohydrates before exercise and they mustn't worry about all the sugar they're taking in their diet, that was completely wrong. And so I decided with my ethical duty to, to everyone to say I was wrong and I apologize and that I think that people should 
change their ideas. Mm. And I believe now, three years down the line, I've read so much that there is so much evidence that this is correct, that not everyone benefits from a high carbohydrate diet, but, mm -hmm. but much more importantly, that it's been our shift from this, the proper foods, real foods, to processed foods, many of which are loaded with carbohydrates and sugar, mm -hmm. which in my view is the cause of our current ill health, particularly our diabetes and obesity epidemics, which are ravaging all the all countries at the moment. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, it's pretty shocking, and um, it's absolutely amazing and commendable that you know you've been able to sort of switch it on its head and sort of you know look at all of the science out there and come to the conclusion that like you know um, carbs isn't for everyone, um, and especially athletes as well. But what what was it that really sort of set in stone the switch for you? Uh, the, the answer was that I just finished writing Waterlogged, which is my book about about how over-drinking causes problems in runners. And the mm -hmm. night I finished it, my brain said to me, you must get up tomorrow morning and you must go out and run. And you mustn't stop running for the rest of your life. So I went out and I was so atrociously unfit that I realized it for the first time because I'd been so focused on the book for two or three years. I hadn't noticed my physical condition had got had deteriorated. And so I came home and there was an advert, that, an email advert that I received titled a new Atkins for the new you, lose six kilograms in six weeks without hunger. And I looked at that and I said, but that's bogus. You can't lose weight without hunger. You have to have hunger. And anyway, I then went and read the book by Westman and Volek and Finney, mm. who are three good scientists who I know about and I respect their opinion. And then I went and it, it had a story about low carbohydrate diets. And I I'd honestly never, ever, ever read that. <laughs> and here I was, 35 years in the medical profession, and I'd never read anything about low carbohydrate diets and their effect on the human body. Other than some studies we'd done long ago, which we didn't actually think as low carbohydrate, we just thought they were fat loading. Mm -hmm. So we gave people lots of fat, but they still had lots of carbohydrate. So this concept of eating more fat but no carbohydrate was completely foreign to me. So anyway, I was so convinced by what I read that I said, that's it. And at lunchtime, I had my first full fat protein meal, <laughs> no carbohydrate meal. And I've been doing it for two and three quarter years now. And I felt so much better. Instantly, I felt better. Within a few days, I felt much better. My running just improved and my energy levels just shot up, as, as everyone will tell you. And but, but the most interesting thing was that I, I dropped my half marathon time which by 40 minutes, which, which tells you I was going really slowly. But that 40 minutes meant the world to me because now I felt like an athlete again, although I'm a slow athlete now. I didn't feel like a, a ball of fatness running. <laughs> I now feel like I'm actually athletic and lean. And for my age, I think I look good and I run quite fast. And that's terribly important. And if I'd been continued to eat those carbohydrates, I would be 20 kilograms heavier and running 40, 40 minutes slower. And in fact, not running, just barely living. And so for me, it's been absolutely life-changing. And what's really been interesting in South Africa that I've obviously been castigated for it by many colleagues and particularly mm -hmm. the dietitians. And they've called it the Noakes diet, which kind of like the Atkins diet. And no one wants to be on the Atkins diet. You don't want to be on the Noakes diet. But I've received about 180 letters, and I've just analyzed them, and I'm about to publish a paper on what, what the outcomes were, but it's astonishing. 120 of those reported how much weight they'd lost, and every, almost to a man, they said, or a woman, they said, I feel so much better. I've got more energy. I've got no hunger. And my running has improved, and, and the running in some people, it, it's improved unbelievably. <laughs> I mean, yeah. There's one guy who dropped his 56 kilometer, that 35 mile race time, by three hours from six hours 57 to three hours 57. And, and three hours 57 in this race for, for 56 kilometers is a remarkably good run. Yeah. And he's running better at 35 than he's ever done in his life before. So, and he's not the only one. Bruce Fordyce, who won the Comrade Marathon nine times 
and who I helped with his nutrition in the 1970s. And I said, Bruce, you must take lots of carbohydrates and so on and so forth. But like all of us, he put on weight and he then decided to cut the sugar and the bread and he dropped his 5K time from 23 minutes back to 17 minutes. He used, he used to run 15 minutes, but now I remember he's 57 and he's running 17 minutes for 5Ks at, at 57. And he dropped his comrade's marathon time. I mean, he's still nowhere near where, where he was because he won the race in 5.20, but he's got back to seven and a half hours from nine and a half hours. So he's also dropped his comrade's marathon time two hours. But, but that doesn't tell you the story. It, it's, the, it's the incredible energy that we all have now, mm. which we just didn't have. And, and Bruce said that he said, I was hating my running. Here I am, the father of running in South Africa. <laughs> Having won this race nine times, no one ever will come close to that. That's and right. he was struggling to run, and he just stopped the sugar and the bread. But, but it seems <laughs> funny, doesn't it, Tim? Because, you know, we're, we're told to fuel our running, right, um, with sports drinks, um, with carbo loading the, the night before and things like that. So, you know, the question holds, like, you know, why, why isn't that necessarily true? That, that's a wonderful question, and, and you know, Bruce told me, he said, within a week of stopping sugar, he said, I felt better, I was already running faster, I, ran, I dropped 40 seconds in my 5K time within one week of stopping sugar. Wow. Now, what is that? To me, that tells me there's something harmful about the product, which mm -hmm. we simply don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so these are early days, but for the other guy to improve his performance by three hours in that way, and go from looking frankly like a slob to a real athlete was astonishing. But again, the point is it's not simply the weight loss. That doesn't explain it. There has to be something else. And I think that in certain people, we either the diet is nutritionally deficient, I mean the high carbohydrate diet, because we know there are far more nutrients in a high fat, high protein diet, mm. or else in these people there is some toxic accumulation of something. And, and I, that's not impossible because there are studies in diabetics now that when you put them on a high fat diet, you reverse their, their heart dysfunction. Yeah. And there's, a, there's another study, the same, that it's thought that high carbohydrate diets damage the heart in, in, in people who've got heart failure. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's understand that they've already got heart failure. Right. But they're eating a high carbohydrate diet is damaging to the heart. Now, that's the opposite of what we've been told. We've been told that muscles work best on sugar and carbohydrate. And it, it seems to me that there's going to be a lot of evidence that's not the case. But to come back to the point that why is it if you watch the London Marathon or the South African Marathon and it's the guys finishing in five hours, they're all fat. But, but why are they fat? They're running 50, 60 kilometers a week. Why are they fat? The answer is because they're eating so much carbohydrate. Yeah. And if they would just cut the carbohydrate, they would drop their times by an hour without doing one further step of training. That's it. And so the advice to eat a high carbohydrate diet, I agree, may work for some elite runners because they are okay, their bodies are fine, they, they can metabolize carbohydrate. But that doesn't mean that the guy running five hours or six hours in the marathon is going to benefit from carbohydrate. And unfortunately, all the research that we've done and all the other laboratories have done and it's funded by industry and it's funded by the carbohydrate industry. Who do we test? We go and find the best athletes and we test them. We don't go and look for the guys running six hours in the marathon and try and study whether he's going to benefit from carbohydrates or fats. So the, the data is all biased towards healthy young people who are mm -hmm. lean. And the assumption being that if you're fat and lazy and so on, the same time it's going to help you. Well, my the clear evidence is that that's simply not the case. And, and just to finalise that, the point is that the majority of runners are not lean and athletic. No. And we are targeting them with the wrong dietary advice, in my view. That's it, because um, a lot of the um, sort of sports performance studies are on you know young lean people, and um, one thing. One thing that uh, Gary Tobb said um, was it's like, um, you know, a load of greyhounds trying to turn basset hounds into greyhounds. You know, it's not going to happen. Um, and it's just total, total polar opposites. You know, these people are sort of 
self-selected, they can handle carbohydrate and, you know, whatever they eat, they're going to perform to a certain elite level, you know. Um, yeah. But, you know, obviously if they nailed their nutrition even more, then they'd improve their performance even more. Um, and that's one thing that I get a lot of questions about um, in terms of, so isn't, isn't a low-carb, high-fat diet going to um, decrease my performance? What do you say to people about that? Well, the answer is that each of us has only so much carbohydrate that we can cope with. And my view is that firstly, carbohydrates are completely unessential in the diet. You, you can live on 0% carbohydrate. And I really didn't fully understand that until more recently. So if you take carbohydrates, there's only one thing that happens to them. You either burn them, you oxidize them as fuel, or you store them as fat. There's nothing else you can do with them. There's no way you can build your brains or your muscles or your heart or anything with carbohydrates. You can, you can only build things from protein and fat. So that's the first important point. And the second important point, I think, is that you have to balance your carbohydrates every day. So if you don't oxidize them, you store them as fat. And that's why people eating a high carbohydrate diet, that they have to exercise each day to burn off the excess because if they don't burn that excess, they store it as fat. And so the studies we're doing now show a really interesting point that people on a high carbohydrate diet, if you exercise them and compare them to people eating a high fat diet, the high carbohydrate diet people do burn more carbohydrate during exercise, but it's not much more. But when they burn their carbohydrates, it's during the rest of the day. So essentially what's happening is people eating, let's say, more than 100 grams of carbohydrate a day. All they're doing is that they're burning that excess, that 200 or 300 extra grams of carbohydrate. They're burning it during the day when they're not running or not exercising. They're not burning the excess when they're exercising. So if you want to take in 600 grams of carbohydrate a day because you think it's going to help you, it's not really because you're only going to burn 50 of the grams during exercise or 50 extra during exercise and the other 300 during the rest of the day. When you're burning fat, you will burn quite a lot of carbohydrate anyway during exercise, but you'll simply burn fat during the rest of the day. So to come back to my point, I cannot see why anyone needs to, to ingest more than 200 grams of carbohydrate a day. Yeah. Because you have to do a lot of exercise to burn 200 grams of carbohydrate anyway. Mm -hmm. And most people are nowhere near that amount. Mm -hmm. no, then true. if you're carbohydrate tolerant, you can take in your 200 grams, but if like me, you're carbohydrate intolerant, then you need to get below 100 grams and for people like myself, you've got to get below 50 grams. Mm -hmm. And then you start losing weight and you just start to learn how to burn fat and your body adapts and you can burn fat far more effectively. And, and I accept that there may be some people who they lose a little bit of their speed over short distances, maybe over a mile or two. Yeah. But I think you, the benefit is that you bet you're much better able to run the longer distance. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing I find in myself is I just get stronger the further I go, the faster I get. Yeah. It takes, takes time to warm up, but once you warm up, you feel better and you run better. And the other thing is I get the runners high every time I run now, which I didn't used to. <laughs> nice. Uh, when, when I was eating a high carbohydrate diet, it used to take me three or four hours to get a runner's high. Now I get it every run. And I think that's got something to do with the sort of turning on the fat metabolism. Yeah. So. And then just to, as a final point, I have dealt with some elite athletes. Mm -hmm. And one or two of them have dropped their carbohydrates down to 50 and said, no, it's too low, I, I really can't train. But they go up to 100 and they're perfect. And they, they train better on 100 grams than on 400 grams. Right. So there's a, there's a sort that, of a, an intermediate area there where, you know, 100 grams is perfect for some people, for athletes. Exactly. Exactly. But cut it to 50 and they feel terrible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's but for me, if you go over 50, I'll feel terrible. So that, yeah. that, it's highly individual. Yeah, that's And right. just to emphasize that going above 200 grams a day, I can't understand why you would want to mm -hmm. do it. You don't need it. You're not going to burn that, all that excess 200 grams during exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, you're part of this research. Um, so what, what, have you, what are you working on the, at the moment to try and... Um, nail down some of these um, some of these difficulties with low carb. Well, obviously, I do. I'd love to do the single definitive trial that would prove the whole story. Uh -huh. But in fact, 
one can't do that. And as soon as you do, the people will say, well, anyway, the studies haven't lasted 50 years. So yeah. I, I think that nutrition is a religion and we're, we're fighting a religion. That's what we're fighting. And yeah. we have to just help individuals realize that they will feel better if they follow this diet. And that's the best evidence there is. Yeah. The evidence that we're going to live longer if we eat this diet, that might come out in 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. I, I would say the converse, the evidence that if you eat the converse diet, the high carbohydrate diet, that you're going to get progressively iller after 60 or 70. It's so obvious to everyone that it doesn't really mean state need to be stated. So I would love to do the, the single trial, but what we are looking at is, I want to study diabetics because yeah. I think the problem in diabetes is simply that it is a complex condition, but the primary problem is the liver is overproducing glucose. Mm -hmm. And that's clearly my case because my muscles will burn the glucose during exercise, but I can't regulate my glucose because my liver is just pouring out this glucose. And when I use drugs that stop, that inhibit glucose production, my glucose control is perfect. It's just amazing. Mm. So, and, and the point about that is that if you eat a high carbohydrate diet and you're diabetic, your liver is just going to pump out glucose and you cannot regulate your blood glucose safely if you've got a high carbohydrate diet and you're diabetic. So what we're looking at now is developing the method to measure liver glucose production and measuring in the first case in people who are fully adapted to this diet, the high fat diet, mm -hmm. and comparing them to people on high carbohydrate diets. And, and I think we'll be able to show that the liver can produce enormous amounts of carbohydrate from even if you're eating a high fat diet, if you adapt. Yeah. And, and that will sort of, the, the statement the diabetologist tells you, oh, you have to take in 200 grams of carbohydrate a day because your brain needs 200 grams. And they don't understand that the liver can churn out 200 grams quite easily, even on a high fat diet. Yeah. So I'd like to show that, and then like to show that in diabetics, that if you give them a low carbohydrate diet, their liver glucose production is dramatically reduced and their glucose control becomes much easier. They don't need to take as much medication, either orally or injectable. And it's not as if this work hasn't been done. It's, it's in the literature, but it's simply ignored. So, right. so that's where we're starting. And uh, we're trying to get money together for a clinical trial in diabetics to show how they benefit from, from a low-carbohydrate diet versus a high-carbohydrate diet. Because I think that that is easier to prove. It's difficult for a diabetologist to argue that if a person is using less medication and their glucose is better controlled, that actually the diet's done them well and that they are likely to live longer. Mm -hmm. It's much more difficult to take a population and change their, their diet and say, okay, their blood pressure comes down, their cholesterol comes down. Are they going to live longer? Well, that's, that's, that you'd say yes, but it's, it's a difficult one, that one. It's, it would be more difficult to prove. So we're looking at short-term studies where, which we yeah. can afford and which will make, make a difference. I might just add that of those 125 people who'd written to me about their diet, there were 14 who cured themselves of diabetes. Now, wow. I'm, taught, I'm taught in medicine that diabetes is incurable. I'm talking about type 2 diabetes, of course. Yeah. We're taught that it's incurable and that you just take more carbohydrate. So you've got to take more medication all your life. And this is clearly not the case. And you just have to cure one diabetic to prove that you, that, all, that that some are curable. And oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think yeah. that's important information. And also, we we had about six or eight to control their blood pressure on the start. Their blood pressure normalised. And yes. and everyone will tell you. I mean, I, my, I can remember being taught in medical school that a person with hypertension will be hypertensive for the rest of their life, and they must take medication because if they stop, they're going to die. Well, if they change their diet, some of them may be or will, will be able to stop their medication. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely horrendous um, that, that people put it that way to the patients that, like, you know, you're going to have this, there's nothing that we can do, and things like this. But if people are presented with the option, of a diet intervention and you know most recently uh, one of my clients just came off of metformin so I was like absolutely astounded and you know her blood sugar levels are absolutely normal um, and yeah yeah it's just an amazing moment um, exactly when that happens. and, and, and it's, it's, it's a miracle <laughs> yeah. because because what's the disease that's killing us is diabetes, but it's curable in some people, in a majority, in my view, if you catch it early enough. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, it just changed the diets. And so, you know, imagine if we were back 100 years ago and, and we came along and there was a disease like typhoid and I came, we came along and we found the drug that cured typhoid. I mean, we'd get the Nobel Prize. Yeah. But because we found, not we, but someone has found the cure for diabetes is simply change the diet. No one's interested. They're just not it's, interested. Because it's not a drug and it can't be patented and it's not going to win a Nobel Prize. Absolutely bizarre, isn't it? Um, yeah. Now we do. We've got a couple of questions um, on Facebook for you. Um, yeah. First one is oh, we've sort of answered that. Does Tim have any uh, other experiments or studies planned? Um, sounds like we've got a few coming on there. Um, here's here's a nice technical one for you um, from Carol uh, Luffelman. Um, she says, does the mitochondrial production of water as a byproduct of cellular respiration account for the less than expected need for water? Absolutely correct, yes it does. And, and also the fact that you probably store quite a lot of water before you exercise. Yeah. And also there's probably an excess fluid in the gut. There's probably two liters of fluid in the gut. Mm -hmm. And the one theory, which, which has never been proven, but which seems logical, is that as you lose water because you're sweating, you actually re you resorb some of that water from the gut. And that allows you to protect yourself, even though you are losing water from the body. Yeah. And again, to, thank you for that question, because we have studied 10 to 12% weight loss in marathon runners and ultramarathon runners without any apparent change in their performance. Wow. And when Haile Gabriel Selassie was studied, setting a world record in the marathon, he lost 10% of his body weight. He lost five kilograms. And he speeded up at the finish of the race. So here's a guy who's lost 10% of his body weight. Wow. And his performance is not impaired. In fact, it's probably helped because he's, he's lost, a lot of, lost a lot of weight. So there, there must be stores of water in the body that you can draw on. Yeah, yeah. The, the body I, can... I think those are the, that's where they're coming from. Yeah, so it's not necessarily like water in doesn't, necessarily mean water out so as you're drinking through your um your long run like it doesn't mean that it's going to be drawing on that water yeah exactly and so that you don't need to replace all yeah, the way need to do you just, gonna... just remember as i emphasize my book water log that the body doesn't regulate its body water content mm -hmm. it regulates the osmolality of the blood the sodium content of the blood Right. That's what it regulates. And it, sometimes it has to do it by with releasing water from the bloodstream mm -hmm. in order to keep your blood sodium concentration normal. Amazing. Um, now, Phil Thompson asks, how much water or water-based beverage would Tim expect a typical adult to drink daily? Well, the, the, the typical requirement is two and a half liters, two and a half to three liters per day. And if you exercise, it probably adds about 800 ml per hour of your exercise. Right. So that's generally what it is. But the key is that the, the brain is the regulator. And as long as you're drinking to thirst, mm -hmm. your body will be doing it perfectly. Your body will never allow you to become dehydrated. The only people who ever become dehydrated are not running the London Marathon, where there's a second space every, every yeah. two miles or a mile and a half. You can't become dehydrated under those circumstances. It's okay. only when you get lost in the desert without water. Yeah, that's when you become. several days. <laughs> exactly. And then you can die from dehydration. But no runner ever died of dehydration. No. But, but some have died of overhydration. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I suppose that in your training for, you know, long runs, I, I, would you recommend it be important to, you know, go out without water? No, I think you should or, drink to thirst and, yeah, drink the yeah, I certainly, I certainly drink very, very little in training, and yeah. we always did in the seventies before the ideas changed. Right. But I, I would think you drink to thirst, and that that's right. fine. That's what, that's perfect. That's but the best it, it doesn't, And what you do in training is what you should do in races. Don't suddenly change because you're racing. You think you must take in more fluids. Mm -hmm. Not to, just drink to thirst always, and in races just as in training. Right. Awesome. And then uh, last, last question from Richard Jackson. Um, 
what's Professor Tim's take on fatty beef biltong or dry wars? So you might have to explain uh, explain this one for us here, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it might be a South African. Drew yeah, it is. is. It is that. Uh? Is a jerky or a biltong. That's right. <laughs> so it's meat and fat. And in fact, pemmican was the greatest food that was used by endurance athletes in the 1800s. So people who walked to the Arctic, to the North Pole or the South Pole, they all went on pemmican, which was a bison product made by the the Plains Indians in North America. Mm. And it was two-thirds protein, one-third fat. And it was completely indestructible, and they could live on this food for months. And Terry, who didn't make it to the North Pole, but claimed he did, he said that he preferred panic camp to any best food that he could get at any restaurant in New York. He just loved it, and he ate it for months on end. So, and the, and the whole... The Canadian fur trade was built on pemmican. If you didn't have pemmican, you couldn't go up there and, and shoot the, the furs and bring them back. So that was the food that you really want for prolonged exercise. Unfortunately, it's not made today. They've had carbohydrates to it, and that probably destroys it. So the answer is, if you are fully fat adapted so that you're eating very little carbohydrate, mm -hmm. during exercise, my view, you just eat as you normally eat. So... Whatever you eat during your day is what you eat during exercise. Awesome. And if that happens to be cheese and, and eggs and biltong or the jerky, well, that's what you eat. Nice. But of course, you have to you have to get around your head around that one mm -hmm. because many people are so addicted to eating carbohydrates and they've become so conditioned to think you must eat carbohydrates yeah. that they can't even think that eating meat or drinking milk or drinking coconut oil yeah. would be helpful during a marathon race. Yeah, such a disconnect. Um, and one more question has just come in um, from Emily O'Neill. Uh, what are Tim's thoughts on endurance exercise and weight gain due to increased levels of cortisol? How much weight could a person really gain from this? I'm not quite sure. Is that during exercise or during? Yeah, so um, let me repeat that first bit. Uh, what are Tim's thoughts on endurance exercise and weight gain? due to increased levels of cortisol? Okay, I, if I understand it, let me answer my bias. And I think mm. what I've learned is that if you're gaining weight, it's because you're carbohydrate intolerant and you're eating too much carbohydrate. Yeah. And everyone, once you've been on a high fat diet, you realize that you regulate your weight so easily and exercise is irrelevant. Whether you exercise or not doesn't make any difference. But if people are eating high carbohydrate diets can't control their weight because they have to burn the carbohydrate off every day. And to do that, they've got to go out and exercise. So as soon as you stop exercising on a high carbohydrate diet, your weight has to go up. So my answer is that if you've got a problem with weight gain and you can't control your weight, exercise isn't going to help. Mm. It's of no use to you because the problem is your diet, not your exercise. And so we tell people, if you have to exercise to lose weight, your diet's wrong. Sort out your diet and your weight will sort out. So, sort of itself. so the relationship to cortisol, yes, certainly cortisol might well be a factor causing weight gain. Right. But I think the principal driver is insulin, as, as you know from your own experience as an experiment. Mm -hmm. You need to get your insulin down. And you do that by reducing your carbohydrate intake. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, I thank you so much for your time today, Tim. Um, and um, what what's going to be happening over the next like over the next half of this year for for Professor Tim Noakes? Well, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to finish off a short book on on nutrition as I understand it mm. and how people should be eating. And it's going to be a very very simple guide. It's not going to be the law of running or water logs. It's going to be 60, 80, 100 pages, and it's going to just say these are the rules and that's what you have to do. Brilliant. Because that's what I've discovered people are really wanting at this moment. They now have mm -hmm. heard of this low-carb diet, yes. and they just say, please don't give me all the science and don't tell me why it works. Just, just give me what I have to eat. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm working on at the moment as my priority. But I'm also, we're starting a website as well, and continuing with our research on these, this, which we discussed earlier, and trying to raise money for more research in the future. 
Brilliant. So there's a lot of a lot happening, and it's all nutritional, and it's all trying to get the public to change the public opinion of what they should be eating. Absolutely. Um, and uh, what what's the web address for that? Sorry, Tim, when it's up. Oh, uh, we haven't quite got there yet. It's good. Okay. It's Tim and no Tim and Melvin Noakes. That's the myself and my wife. Brilliant. And so we haven't quite got there yet, but I guess it'll be a month or two. It'll be it should yeah. be online. Well, send that to me, and I'll uh, and I'll distribute that for you. Thank you very much indeed. Oh no worries, Tim. Um, and then um, also, um, I got I got a tweet from the guys from Serial Killers as well um, the other day, just saying thank God that they're fat adapted because it seems like they're doing a lot of uh, sitting down. <laughs> 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 so um, yeah, can, can you just give us a little insight into serial killers at all? Because this is going to be a great documentary. As it looks. Yeah, I, well, the Irishman Donald came and came and saw me, and he was motivated because his father was one of the elite athletes in Ireland and developed mm. a heart attack in his mid sixties. And he said the only thing he ever did wrong was he had a cigar once a month. He'd done everything else, as, it, as the book said. He'd been exercising. He ate his muesli for breakfast. He avoided the fat in the diet mm -hmm. and he still had a heart attack and so Donald was interested in finding out why and so he came to Cape Town and put himself on a high fat diet and we monitored his changes in in everything and of course nothing got worse everything got better and uh, so that was what we were trying to show which of course has been shown scientifically but often when you do it with a single individual it's quite powerful yeah. So the, the movie is about his his father's history, what he did in Cape Town, mm -hmm. and other interviews with some of the leading people in this field, explaining why a low fat diet is actually bad for you and a high fat diet is actually good for you. So that's kind of the basis of the of the of the measure of the message. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm very much looking forward to it, and I'm a, I'm one of the backers um, on Kickstarter. So um, I think they got a little bit to go before they get to their um, full. Um, amount that they need okay. to raise to get it distributed, but um, yeah, yeah, highly recommend everybody heading over to Kickstarter and searching for serial killers. <laughs> I'll, put, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll put links to that because um, it looks like it's going to be a really powerful film, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully it gets the recognition that it deserves. Absolutely. Um, well, again, thank you so much, Professor, for your time. I know it's very, very precious. And uh, yeah, well, hopefully we can get you back on once you've launched this uh, this new website and when the uh, when the new book comes out as well. Thank you very much, and it's been a great privilege to chat to you. Absolutely, no problem, Professor. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Cheers. Ta-ra then. Bye-bye.